African heartbeat in her breast, African heartbeat in this child, African heartbeat all the while. African heartbeat in this song, African heartbeat for so long, African heartbeat strong and free, African heartbeat one, two, three. determination to fight, which some of us are proud to see. And we cannot have a solidarity meeting without us in the audience expressing our solidarity to our heroic comrades, friends, brothers, and sisters in the Palestine organization and the Palestinian people. We have from the Minister Collins, from the Minister, who is glad to sit with a lot of life. Thank you very much. I have the privilege to address this rally on behalf of the Palestine Liberation Organization to express our support to the black people for their struggle against racial discrimination. It's natural that our people will sit behind the old first people all over the world because our people have been suffered the racial discrimination for over now 40 years. Our people have been suffered from the racial discrimination from the Zionists who have been occupied our land and drove us from our land. The Palestinian struggle for democratic secular state in Palestine. Our people struggle for non sectarian state, the Zionists the Zionist fight for racist state that this is better for a Jew, but the Jews will come, the Arabs are not welcome. Even in the Jew, there is also in Israel kind of discrimination between Oriental Jew and European Jew. This kind of state which the American and the imperialism support, the state of Israel support the racist there is a racist regime in South Africa, which all of you know what kind of regime in South Africa. The Palestinian people and the Palestinian revolution stood behind the, Palestinian, the African people, the South African people, and the African the people in Latin America and all over the world, and their struggle to get their rights. Our people always stood behind the people all over the world to have equal rights, not black, white better than black, or not Jews better than Muslim or Christian. We are all people. We should all have equal rights. Why this kind of discrimination among the people? I will assure you, 
And he said, this time we face a very great difficulty in the area that the Palestinian people will continue the struggle against the Zionists, against the imperialism. Our people will continue to support all the oppressed people all over the world. We suffer a lot from that. The American, because we are supporting the, uh, the people in Latin America, are not happy from the Palestinians. So that's one of the reasons why they want to annihilate us in Lebanon. That's one reason why they want to destroy the PLO. These people, because we ask to get our rights, we fight to get our rights, they call us terrorists. But the terrorists who refuse to give the people their rights, not us. So, brother and sister, and then I would like to send the greeting, to express our greeting to you in this rally, and I think it's very successful rally, and I assure you that the Palestinian people will stand behind you in your struggle to have equal rights, like any other people in the world. Thank you very much. And now we come on to Kwame Suri. Just before he stands up, I would like to welcome him, welcome him here, Kwame Turi. We wish to thank you, the people who came, and you without whom the program would have been an abysmal failure. In the second instance, we wish to thank the Hackney's Black People's Association for its untiring work, for its indomitable will, and we wish also, of course, to thank its chairperson. <laughs> And we wish also to thank its chairperson, Brother Lester Lewis. In the third instance, we wish to thank those on the platform, servants of the revolution. Brothers and sisters, our task here this evening is to try and raise our level of consciousness. Hopefully, this level of consciousness, once being raised, will be manifested in direct action in uncompromising struggle against the enemy. Brothers and sisters, we have before us an enemy who is on his deathbed. This enemy will not die until we ourselves are properly organized. <laughs> We know that it is a dialectical world, and even though capitalism, a vicious, stupid, backward, and barbaric system, seeks to deny it, it uses us. It uses its dialectics. One of the many laws of dialectics says that everything is at the same time similar and dissimilar. That is clear. As you look among the audience, you will see each of us are similar, men and women, equal in every right and every respect. 
But at the same time, while being similar, we are dissimilar. Different heights, different shapes, different complexions, different tastes, different theologies. We say everything is similar and dissimilar, and the enemy, capitalism, uses dialectic against us. It is our responsibility to come to master it so that we can use it properly in the interest of the masses of the people. Animals of the lower form, like us human beings, we have similarities and dissimilarities. We are similar to animals of the lower form in that, like them, we have instinct and act on instinct. We are dissimilar from animals of the lower form in two arena, in the material arena and in the immaterial arena. In the material arena, we are shaped differently, we have hands, which allow us the ability to make tools. With these tools, we can come to change the environment. Consequently, by our very shape alone, a responsibility is imposed upon us to change the environment for the better. We are unlike animals of the lower form in the immaterial aspect in that we can think and they cannot. Capitalism seeks to keep us on the animal level. It seeks to keep us acting only on instinct. As a matter of fact, in highly developed capitalist countries, such as in Britain and in the United States of America, capitalism have us reacting to stimuli, and in the act of reacting, we think we are thinking. <laughs> We say the system is doomed, and we come to tell you that even if capitalism keeps us on the animal level, where it tries to keep us, it is still doomed, because human beings have one instinct which animals of the lower form do not have. We have an instinctive love of justice. A cursory look at history will show us everywhere serfs rising up against landlords, slaves rising up against masters, workers rising up against capitalists, everywhere in spontaneous rebellion. We are human beings, and while we have instincts, we must not function on the level of animal. All our instincts must at all times, under all conditions, be guided by a reason. African peoples the world over suffer. In America, we suffer. In the Caribbean, we suffer. In South America, we suffer. In Britain, we suffer. On our continent in Africa, we suffer. And this suffering is a result of the direct exploitation and oppression which we face. Africa is the richest continent on the face of the earth. <laughs> This contradiction will only be resolved through revolution. And by revolution we mean the total destruction of imperialism and the construction of the social system. That Africa will be free is undeniable. That all people will be free is undeniable. We say the instinctive love of justice of human beings alone ensure this. But that the process must be properly effective cause for proper reasoning. Brothers, sisters, we come to help as the Rastafarians say, we must come to reason tonight. <laughs> Our people suffer, we are victims of racism, we are victims of capitalism, and we are landless people. Even in Africa, which belongs to us, even today with so many independent countries, the overwhelming majority of our regimes are reactionary, neo-colonial puppet regimes that we to the They are even where we have a national anthem and a flag and a president. Our labor and our resources are still taken, are ripped from us and sent abroad and leaving us suffering. The struggle which we raise must be a ruthless struggle without pity and without mercy against all those who are The only solution for the African Revolution is Pan-Africanism, the total liberation and unification of Africa on the scientific of socialism. The history of Pan-Africanism is not new. 
It found its organization expressions right here in London in the 1900s. It has gone on and on in 1945, right in Manchester, at the Fifth Pan African Congress, its most important decisions were made. Here, it was decided no longer to appeal to the imperialist powers to alleviate our suffering, but to appeal directly to the masses of our people, the only makers of history, to organize them in a direct confrontation with imperialism. And no more wishing washing dilly dallying with states. A correct and proper decision was made. Africa must be unified and the economic system must be a socialist system. My brothers, my sisters, I tell you honestly, anytime you see an African who is ashamed of Africa, this African is totally ignorant about anything about it. Any man or any woman, African or non-African, who knows anything about Africa must be appreciative of the great contributions which Africa has made to world civilization. Consequently, <laughs> all Africans who are conscious must be proud to be African. <laughs> proud in the history and the legacy which Africa has left us. Africa has been trampled upon and raped upon by just about everybody, but Africa has never raped or trampled upon anybody. <laughs> the understanding of our pride in Africa has to do with the process of political education. Our people are politically backward, trained in these backward systems which keep us alienated from Africa. Until we come to understand Africa, understand that we are Africans, we will not know what our interests are and will find ourselves fighting for capitalism, thinking we are dancing humanity. Any African serving in the army in Britain who has no business there in the first place could never find himself fighting in Ireland if he had the slightest understanding of the history of Africa. <laughs> Africa has been raped and plundered by every Western country except Ireland. <laughs> and Ireland is involved in the struggle against British imperialism. Consequently, it's our job to aid them in the struggle constantly against the British imperialism. <laughs> we could spend more than two weeks here just speaking of the contributions which Africa has made to world civilization. We highlight only three. Simply because we want to impress here, when one is conscious of one's history, responsibility is imposed upon one. <laughs> Look, we have said, the people have instinctive love of justice. This is to be found everywhere. Look at every society. Bring forth your anthropologists. Bring forth your historians. They will tell you that we have found in every society religion. That is to say, we have never found a society without religion. All these religions may vary widely in their form and their ritual as they do. Some have one as God. Some have many as God. Some take the fish and make their God. Some, like the American Indians, understand that Mother Earth is their God. We say all of these very widely, but throughout all of them, following the laws of dialectics, which said everything is similar and dissimilar, one common essential thread runs. Religions are here to make men and women live a better life, to serve a just God, and to fight against injustice all the time. All the time. All of us there must come to respect religion. Even those of us who are atheists must respect religion because they manifest the aspirations of the masses of the people all over the world. <laughs> Africa's contributions to religions are great. We want to mention only three. We do not speak of Africa's own religions. We leave that for the minute. We just want to show contributions to world religions. We say history imposes responsibilities upon us. Every man or woman who's read the Bible, every man or woman who's read the Torah, anyone who knows anything about the history of Judaism knows that this was Africa's gift to the world. Judaism began in Egypt in Africa. 
They say history imposes responsibilities upon you. Once you know that Africa gave Judaism to the world, you have a responsibility, even if you are not of the Jewish religion, even if Judaism is not your religious persuasion, to defend the integrity of Judaism. It is for this reason that all conscious Africans must, without pity and without mercy, uncompromisingly oppose Zionism everywhere, all the time. Yeah. This immoral, unjust, racist, and illegal system seeking to take a religion which is brought to serve God, to serve justice, and use it as a tool to uproot the Palestinian people and scatter them to the wind will face exactly what it will face, complete and total destruction. The Palestinian people will get their land back. <laughs> Some of us who are Christians are confused about Christianity. I heard one of my brothers the other day said, I ain't got nothing to do with that white man's religion. <laughs> oh, my brother, look properly at Christianity. If one would read the Bible, the first country mentioned in the Bible, Genesis 2, verse 13, is Ethiopia. <laughs> Depending upon the verse of the Bible you have, this Ethiopia might be spelled Kush, C-U-S-H, or Kush, K-U-S-H. If you will go to an authoritative source, you will see Kush, either with a C or a K, is the ancient name for Ethiopia. We're not chauvinists, but we're telling you, in Genesis 1, God created the world, and in Genesis 2, he said, well, uh, here's Ethiopia. <laughs> We must come to understand the relationship of Africa in history and her contributions to civilization. The first church in the world was in Africa. The first monastery in the world was in Africa. The very intellectual development of the church itself was the result of Africans in Alexandria. Why, St. Augustine ain't nothing but an African. <laughs> Everywhere you will find it. When Jesus Christ was in trouble, his mother took him to Egypt, and it is here that he spent ten years going physically, spiritually, and morally. <laughs> Anyone who knows anything about Christianity knows that Europe is not mentioned in the Bible until near the very end. <laughs> Anyone who has a cursory understanding of the life of Jesus Christ knows that he never saw Europe. <laughs> Anyone who has any slight understanding of the history of Christianity knows that his disciples never saw Europe. <laughs> The religion of Christianity was spread to Europe by the apostles who came long after the disciples. And anyone who has a penetrating analysis and understanding of the history of Christianity knows that it took 400 years after the death of Jesus Christ to consolidate Christianity in Europe. The system, the system, the capitalist system, the enemy seeks to confuse us. It is for this reason that throughout the length and breadth of Canada, throughout the length and breadth of the Caribbean, in South America, in America, in our homes, in our bedrooms, in our kitchens, in our cars, you can find the picture of a white Jesus. Yes. We're not here to debate the color of Jesus Christ, we're here to tell the truth. <laughs> As a matter of fact, an understanding of Christianity would let you know that Jesus Christ could be just about any color, but the one color he definitely could not be is <laughs> white. It is only when we come to analyze properly that we will come to understand the debilitating effects that it has upon many of our people who call themselves Christians that see the image of Jesus Christ as a white man. This must be dealt with seriously. Struggles must be weighed on every level, and it is the job of African Christians to lead this struggle in the front line. <laughs> Africa's contribution to Islam is clear. Islam did not develop in Africa, it developed in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca. The leader! 
The great prophet Muhammad, like all great religious men, was a fighter against injustice. He fought it everywhere. His first line of battle were the feudal lords of Mecca, and feudal they were. Muhammad fought them everywhere. They came to fight him when he was not prepared and he had to retreat. In retreating, he gave orders to his disciples. He told them, go to Africa. There you will find proper refuge. <laughs> Following the orders of the Prophet Muhammad, his disciples went to Ethiopia. The Ethiopians had relations with the feudal lords of Arabia. They had political, diplomatic, and commercial relations. The feudal lords pursued them into Ethiopia and demanded that the Ethiopian king hand them over so they could be executed. The Ethiopians refused. Not only did they refuse, they protected them, fed them spiritually, physically, morally, and went after the people of Medina had come to the prophet, asking him to come there because they were looking for a just prophet. They themselves directed and guided the disciples there, allowing Islam to spread rapidly. We speak not only of the contributions of Africa to Islam, but of the contributions of Africans to Islam. Everyone who knows anything about Islam has heard everywhere the name Bilal. Bilal was an African slave, freed by the disciples of the Prophet Muhammad. Everyone who knows anything about Islam knows that the Prophet Muhammad was an illiterate. He couldn't read or write. He recited the Holy Quran. It was written down by those around him, and Bilal did a lot of writing of the Holy Quran. All religions and means and methods of worship, of ways according to people to worship. And if one would look at Islam, its means according to people to worship is through the human voice. This method was a contribution to be, of Bilal to the religion of Islam. We have mentioned only three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And we have mentioned and demonstrated Africa's contribution to it. My brothers and sisters, do you know that a overwhelming majority of the masses of our people do not know of Africa's contribution to these great religions even though they adhere to them? Political education is the only answer. Constant political education. Constant we say that we must come to be proud of Africa. We must come to seek her unity. She's the richest continent on the face of the earth. Once properly organized, she will be one of the most powerful, able to protect her children wherever they are and be a proper voice for world peace. <laughs> we say the economic system must be that of scientific socialism. And here we must do some serious work. Some are confused, and the confusion comes from many who call themselves revolutionary, pretending to be revolutionary, but in fact they're die-hard reactionaries. They come to say all sorts of nonsense about socialism. Karl Marx is a great man. No one can deny that. And not even Karl Marx himself can deny the fact that he did not invent socialism because socialism is the truth and cannot be invented. No one can invent it. No truth can belong to anyone. We call the laws of gravity Newton's laws. But everyone knows that Newton could not invent that a body in motion tends to stay in motion unless stopped by an outside force. A little baby running into the wall knows this. <laughs> we call it Newton's laws because given the society, this is the man whom we know is the first one to have written it down. Let it be crystal clear. Any of us sitting in Timbuktu, never having heard of Newton, observing the laws of gravity would come to the exact same conclusion <laughs> that Newton did. <laughs> so it is with socialism. Socialism is a truth. And even Karl Marx never discovered it. You and I, sitting in Timbuktu, studying properly the objective laws of society, would come to the exact same conclusions as Karl Marx did. <laughs> it must be properly understood. We will struggle seriously against all forms of mystification in our movement, because it is mystification that's our greatest enemy. The, re the revolution must be led by science, so that everyone everywhere can see it and understand it and manifest it. 
They cannot be read. Some only understand, and only those who are gifted can understand. Everybody must understand because everybody must take this conversation. Thank you. Socialism is scientific. It is a science. It must be studied. Any African, even an unconscious African, must be suspicious of capitalism because of the discovery it threats upon our continent and keeps us in chain to the day. <laughs> and any conscious African must with every fiber in his body, every minute of the day, work for the total destruction of this vicious system. <laughs> we say the only solution is the Pan-Africanism, which is the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. Until Africa is free, no African anywhere in the world will ever be. <laughs> the truth of these statements have to be seen. Some will come to raise confusion. Well, I was born in Britain. Well, I was born in Jamaica. Well, I was born in Grenada. It doesn't make a difference where one is born. What is important is not even where one fights, but what one is fighting for. <laughs> we have here before us a brother who was born in South Africa. He came before us this evening. We have here a Palestinian who came before you this evening. Must you think that because they're in London, they're not fighting for the liberation of South Africa or the liberation of Palestine? No. By coming here and giving us political education, inspiring us to continue the struggle, they aid their own particular struggle. Consequently, wherever one is, one can struggle. The question is, what is one struggling for? Are we struggling to bring about a free and socialist Britain? Of course we are. There's no question here. A free and socialist Britain helps all the world, helps us. It will stop exploiting us. Give consciousness to the white working class, stop them from being racist. Yes, it helps us. But is it our primary struggle? No, sir. No, sir. Just like this Palestinian sitting here, just like a conscious Irishman born in London understands its primary struggle is the liberation and unification of Ireland, so too we who are born in Britain must understand our primary struggle is the total liberation and unification of Africa on the side of the world. Does that mean that we do not struggle in Britain? On the contrary! Once you know you're fighting for socialism in Africa, you know Britain is our major enemy! You hit the enemy anywhere you find him! <laughs> On the contrary, you are impelled into struggle! You hate British imperialism more! Because not only does it affect you, but it affects your people everywhere! Consequently, your wrath is greater against it! And Africanism is the only solution to our problem. <laughs> only solution. Throughout the length and breadth of the Caribbean, while we struggle for independence and socialism, it is to Africa that we must look for the solution to the problem. Brothers and sisters, we say that in order to wage revolution, it must be done in an organized manner. This then is our greatest problem. If you will look at our people all over the world, wherever you find us, you will find that we are disorganized. <laughs> Go to the United States of America. Go to Harlem. We're disorganized there. Go to the length and breadth of the Caribbean. Go to Trinidad, where I was born. We're disorganized there. Go to the African continent, up and down its breath, you up and down the left and breath, you will find they are disorganized there. Come to Britain, where we suffer, and at least there are so few of us we should be huddled together, here too we are disorganized. All revolutionaries, all men and women of intelligence will tell you, you learn by doing. There is no other way. I met a stupid man the other day who sought to argue with me about the fact of learning swimming without getting in the water. 
I told him, no, sir. You can read all you want, you can look at all the movies you want, you can even dream about it, but until you get into the water, <laughs> one organizes by getting into an organization. This is the appalling fact. In Britain, 95% of the masses of our people do not belong to any organization fighting for the benefit of our people. This must change radically, and it is only we ourselves who can change it and must change it. Understand? We know all the excuses given. Ask the brother. Brother, why ain't you an organization? Oh, man, all them organizations not serious, you know. The leader this, the leader that, and that's why I ain't in them. But brother, in order to fight the enemy, can you do it by yourself? No way. There's no such thing as Superman. This is only capitalist culture that can produce such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it is only the people that can destroy the enemy. Consequently, if one is seriously concerned about destroying the enemy, if one is seriously concerned about constructing one's society, one must be in an organization. Those who come to tell you that they're all bad organizations, I tell you as an organizer, a statement which is true. Bad organization is better than no organization at all. The solution to that is very simple. We said we came here to raise our level of consciousness. We came here to help manifest this raising of level of consciousness. All of those of you who came into this meeting must understand that you have a responsibility not only to join an organization if you are not in an organization or create an organization, but you also have the responsibility to politically educate all our brothers and sisters to join an organization or create an organization. As in all things, the truth is never difficult. Difficulty only arises in the implementation of the truth. Everyone knows it's the truth and you shouldn't lie. The difficulty only arises in the implementation of the truth. But all of us sitting here in this audience know that if we want to be free, it is only adherence to the truth that will free us. Nothing else. Nothing else. You can have the biggest guns in the world, but if you don't have the truth, you will be defeated. Vietnam demonstrated that before the eyes of the world. <laughs> Consequently, our organizations must be built around the truth. Imagine, in, irrespective of how bitter it is, we must come to understand it and live it. In fact, we do this all the time. If your mother came to you and said the world is flat, you say, no, mama, don't say that. It's round. <laughs> You don't want your mother saying nonsense. <laughs> you don't want your mother living by backward concepts. If your child comes and tells you two plus two is five, you say, no, it's four. And you explain to him why it's four, how it's four, so he can understand it. The truth is that we must have organizations. The enemy which we fight is organized. <laughs> the enemy against which we fight is organized on every level. And not only are they organized on every level, every day, using technology, they become better organized in the means of oppressing us. So, in the 1981s, throughout Britain, we had spontaneous rebellions. The police were unprepared for them. Consequently, as the brothers say in the States, they were caught with their pants down. <laughs> but you must not think that in 1983, they're in the same position as they were in 1981. <laughs> in 1983, they are better organized using better instruments of technology to oppress us. Consequently, when we come up against them, we must be better organized in 83 than we were in 81. <laughs> Organization is exactly what we want. Spontaneous rebellion will never bring the enemy down, never. It is only organized struggle on a day-to-day -day basis, taking at him every day, chipping a little piece here, a little piece there, a little piece here, a little piece there, until he comes down. But it must be done on a constant, continual, non-stop basis. 
It is only an organization that can do this. Africa doesn't lack anything to defeat the enemy except this. Organization. We have no problem in Britain. Even in Britain, once our people are properly organized, all we will demand is that each of them give 25 cents a week and we will have enough money to do everything that we need to do inside of Britain without asking anybody for anything. Organization. Organization. What does it take for a brother to give up a pack of cigarettes for the liberation of his people for a week? Nothing. What does it take for a sister to sacrifice something? She's always ready to sacrifice. It is a question of proper organization. <laughs> to have organization, one must have clear ideology. Ideology of principles which must be held uncompromisingly. That is to say, once you adhere to the principle, you can't compromise it. All of our people who we see compromising, the reason they compromise is because there is no organization. You spoke about your MPs, how some 38 of them didn't respond. The reason they don't respond is because we're not organized and they know they don't represent us. They represent the parties that put them in power and we're not even organized to the one day. Once we are properly organized, none of us would think even entertaining our mind misrepresenting us because of the consequences that will be dealt to us. Organization is the only answer. We say these ideologies must have principles, but let it be clear, one ideology must come from one's culture. One cannot take an ideology from anybody else. One's ideology must come from the culture of one, the history and the struggles of one people, the realities, how imperialism oppressed them, what is the way to get out of the struggle. Consequently, our ideology must be based in the reality of the African struggle. It must be an African ideology. Yeah, because we are oppressed, imbued with inferiority complexes, many of us think that our people are not capable of producing ideology. Therefore, the lazy amongst us seek everywhere to snatch ideology and bring it to us. No, we must bring forth our own ideology based on our own struggle. As a matter of fact, it is there for us. Organization must have precise objectives. Precise. If one doesn't have a precise objective, anything one is doing will take one where one wants to go. But one has, when one has a precise objective, one is able to measure properly whether or not one is advancing or one is retreating from the objective set for one. Of course, we need that mention in an organization. One needs people. It's the primary basis. But above all, the people must have fidelity to the line of the organization. They must be faithful to the ideology of the organization. <laughs> it is in this area that you find us lacking the most. Most of our people are not faithful to anything except material benefits. I'm not speaking of the masses of our people. I'm speaking of that petty bourgeois element which makes up the leadership of our people. It is only the masses properly organized that will keep them faithful to the ideology. The difference between a conscious man and an unconscious man is that a conscious man understands the reasons for all of his actions. An unconscious man does things without even knowing it. Indeed, some of us who are unconscious may have come into this meeting without even knowing why we came. <laughs> Some of us are human beings, as human beings are so unconscious in life that we never even know what is the purpose of human beings for being on the face of the earth. This is not a religious question. This is in no way a theological question. This question is a question dealt with human nature which even each of us must know. Why are human beings placed on the face of the earth and why am I here? Any conscious man. Any conscious woman without reflecting will tell you the reason why human beings are placed on the face of the earth is to make it a better place for those who come after them. It is clear. Every human being in this room is born in debt. Born in debt. When you come into the world, you find your situation of struggle on a higher level. 
A level which is made higher thanks to the struggle of those who came before us. We were put in slavery. Today we're out of slavery. Why? Because of the struggles of those who came before us. Obviously, we can never repay those who came before us. The only way we can repay them is by giving it to those who come after us. Yeah. Consequently, once a human being is born, conscious or unconscious, they are born in debt. And certainly once they are conscious, they must repay this debt. There's nothing like an ungrateful human being. <laughs> As a matter of fact, an ungrateful human being is just like an animal. It understands absolutely nothing. We say the difference between the conscious and the unconscious is that the conscious is aware of the reasons for their acts. Revolutionaries are even on a higher level. Not only are they conscious of their acts, but they try to take the reasons for their acts to effectuate their acts to take self-determination into their own hands. Consequently, the revolutionary not only knows the reason for the act, but tries to effectuate it, so the act will have a better bearing on that objective, making the world a better place for those who come after them. This is our responsibility. The job of capitalism is to make us lazy and stupid and happy in exploitation. This is his job. Indeed, his job is to rationalize us. Go through Britain, see an African brother. Brother, we got to struggle. Oh, no, man, I'm free. I'm in Britain. Yes. <laughs> and they believe this. Yes. Come, brother, we must go to a meeting. Oh, no, man, they got a television program. I got to see you. <laughs> they make them lazy. It is our job to come with constant political education to wake them up. Understand our past. It is constant political education. Just like the enemy is constantly politically educating us through television, through schools, through the radio, through books, through the movies, through the institutions in the society. All we have is our bodies and we must come to train them as perfect instruments in the revolution of perfect service to the masses of our people. Constantly politically educating them. You cannot educate the masses unless you yourself are also studying. And studying is not only a theoretical question, it is also a practical question. Therefore, the only way you can politically organize and politically educate our people is through struggle, constant struggle. Struggle must be constant. We say all the time, the human body is a wonderful piece of machinery, adaptable to just about anything. If I'm used to sleeping 10 hours a night and doing 6 hours a day of work, the night I sleep 4 hours and try to do 10 hours of work, I will be disoriented. If I'm used to sleeping 4 hours a night and playing tennis for 3 hours a day, the day that I sleep 7 hours and don't play tennis, I will be completely disoriented. Once one is trained to serve the people, the day you don't make a contribution to the people, you will never sleep peacefully. <laughs> Not only must we every day serve the people, but every day we must become better in our service to the people. Yesterday I was a good revolutionary. Today I'm better. Tomorrow I shall even be better. Every day I must get better in what I do. I must qualify. Consequently, when we speak of organization, we cannot speak of anything static. No, we ourselves said the enemy is not static. Every day, he seeks to improve his means of oppressing us. Consequently, every day, we must be one step ahead of him in destroying his means of oppressing us. Brothers, sisters, sons and daughters of Africa, organization is what we are lacking. Brothers, sisters, sons and daughters of Africa, those of you who are conscious, come to understand that your contribution to your people's struggle must be made at this time in an organized manner. There is no question that Africa will be free, unified, and socialist, not any. As a matter of fact, there is no question that any people will be free. That's already been said. A clear understanding of human nature demonstrates to us clearly that the people's instinctive love of justice drives them on against forces of oppression. We have so many stunning examples. Look, the Irish, 800 years of constant struggle against British imperialism. 
Look! In Palestine, the Zionists there with all their overwhelming power, but no matter what power they have, every time they think they've crushed the PLO, it pops up one more time to hit them again. Even here, looking at Zionism, we can get a clear example of the necessity of organization. Everyone knows that this vicious system of Zionism, unlike Judaism, diametrically opposed to Judaism. Indeed, any Zionist cannot be a Jew, and any Jew cannot be a Zionist. They're diametrically opposed. Judaism began in Africa. Zionism began with Theodor Herzl in Switzerland. Of course. Highly different in 1897. The very land for the Zionists came from this very imperial nation, Britain, when it signed the Balfour Declaration in 1917. Look at the struggle between the Palestinian people and Zionism. In 1917, when, when Britain gave them the land which was not Britain's to give in the first place, the Palestinian people struggled against Zionism. Look, you will see everywhere spontaneous demonstrations rising up. And even when they rise up spontaneous and the British think they cut off the head of the leadership, the struggle continues. But it's not until 1964 with the organization of the Palestine Liberation Organization that the Palestinian people made qualitative leaps in their struggle. Organization is the answer. Organization is the only answer. We say all people will be free. No force on earth can stop them. If you cannot see it by looking at Ireland and seeing this struggle, which since 800 years is not decreasing, but in fact intensifying, it's only a stupid man like Margaret Thatcher who doesn't know the Irish are going to be free and united. Force. If you cannot see the Palestine, then brothers, sisters, daughters, sons of Africa, look to Africa. Here you will see demonstrated, relentlessly instinctive love of justice everywhere. A few years ago, Africa was dominated by France, Britain, Spain, Germany, Italy, Belgium, Holland, and America. Of course, Portugal. We should name them all. I didn't have time. <laughs> you see our position. If one didn't understand human nature, one would come to think like they did that the situation would remain like this forever. But they forget one fundamental law of science. Everything changes all the time. Nothing remains the same. We say if one would look, one might come to be convinced with them that it will remain the same way. Indeed, right here in Berlin, in 1884, 1885, they sat down and divided Africa. The French took this piece. The Italians took this piece. The Portuguese took this piece. The French took this piece. The Italians took this piece. Belgium took this piece. America took this piece, etc., etc., etc. The will and the instinctive love of freedom can never be quelled in the people. Africa had no guns. They had guns. Africa had no cannons. They had cannons. Africa had no fast boats. They had them. But Africa had human dignity, which refuses to compromise itself in the face of another human being seeking to oppress it. This Africa without guns, this Africa without fast boats, this Africa without cannons started to get itself together through the Italians out, through the Germans out, through the Spanish out, through the French out, through the British out, through the Belgian out, just recently through the Portuguese out. It's only a stupid man or woman who doesn't recognize we're going to crush the racist regime in the southern of <laughs> Africa will be free, unified, and socialist. The only question you must ask yourself is what contribution shall I make to my people's liberation? <laughs> Africa will be free, unified, and socialist. No force on earth can stop it. The only question you must ask yourself 
is what contribution as a human being do I make to the onward march of humanity? Daughters, sons of Africa, your mother is calling loud and clear. Come now, organize for the African Revolution. Ready for the revolution. <laughs> Ready for the revolution! Hold on, Sophie.